I want to invite you to turn with me. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of First Peter. That's near the end of the uh, New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, feel free to grab the one that's in the pew rack ahead of you. And if you don't own one, take this one with you this morning because that's our gift to you and we want it to be a blessing to you. Well, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, though just a few verses there this morning. The words will also be on the screen this morning. Hear these words from the Apostle Peter. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober... Set your heart on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Word of God for the people of God. In your bulletin this morning is a blue sheet that looks like this, and on the front is a place to uh, take some notes as God speaks to you this morning, to write those things down. On the back, as always, are questions you can use in your own study or in your life group. And then this week, we're going to be reading mostly through the book of 1 Peter and, and setting what we have to say today in the larger context of what Peter has to say. So that's for you this morning. A couple weeks ago, I had a week off, and uh, in the midst of that week, as we were trying to relax and, and, and recreate, I had a major computer meltdown, and this is only a little bitty glimpse of what uh, my face looked like in the midst of that. It's kind of complicated to explain, but I'm not sure I even understand everything that led up to it, but the first thing that went was my backup drive. It crashed and, and would not boot, and I said, that's no problem. I can redo that. I still have the original files, right? And so I erased the backup drive to start over. And while I was doing that, the drive with half of my original files crashed at the same time and refused to respond. Now, this is an external hard drive. It's not my main computer, not my Mac. The Mac is fine for those of you who might be worried about that. But I spent two long days myself just fighting this, this technology, trying to get the hard drive to work, all to no avail. And what was on that drive was all of the audio and the movies, and especially was on there was the video I needed for my life group meeting the next evening, and it was gone. It was all gone. Beyond recovery, beyond hope, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. I would need to put that above the, the door of my computer room. And so I grabbed the drive, and I ran to the car, and I went to iMechanic on 3rd Street and told them my sad and desperate story. And they didn't promise anything, but they said, oh, we'll call you this evening. And so that evening, they called me. They said, well, we can see the files on the drive. We're not sure we can recover them. And the hard drive is shot nonetheless. I still don't know what the outcome of that is because they still have my hard drive and hoping to recover it. But what do you do when your computer crashes, when, when everything that you have saved up is, is gone? What do you do? Well, you reboot. You start over at least. Sometimes you have to force it to reboot. Sometimes that, that works. Sometimes it, it doesn't. But when I was back, when I was first learning about computers and how they work, and yes, kids, they did have computers back when I was a kid. <laughs> That was always the answer. You know, you, you reboot. You, when it crashes, you start over. You start fresh. You go back to the last time that everything worked right, the last save point. Reinstall the last good backup. Try these things. What, uh, reboot. Start over. And what's true in the computer world is also very often true in life as well. When life crashes, when things fall apart, sometimes we need to, we need to reboot. We need to come to a place where lie, in life where we return to the, the last time everything worked. We need to reboot, to restart, to recreate. Now, it's not a secret, although there's a lot of folks who may not be aware of it, but I wrote about it in the newsletter this month, and that's that our denomination, the United Methodist Church, is in the midst of a, of a crash of sorts. Certainly, we're at a crossroads. Just recently, we passed the 50-year anniversary of the United Methodist Church, 1968. The former Methodist and Evangelical United Brethren Churches came together to form a, a new denomination. We merged. Now, contrary to what I thought growing up and what some people still think, the word united in our name has very little to do with whether or not we agree with each other because a lot of times we don't. The word united came from the EUB tradition. It was the U, united, in that church's name. We became United Methodist 50 years ago, April 23rd, 1968. And for 40 of those 50 years, we've been arguing over, a lot, well, several things, but particularly what it means to have a Christian ethic of human sexuality. And in the last few years then, and as that mirrors the larger culture, 
that discussion has centered around the issue of, of homosexuality. The, the disagreement has gotten to such a fever pitch that at the general conference meeting in 2016, there was a call made for the bishops to appoint a task force to figure out a way to move forward as a church beyond the arguments and disagreements, to, to, to find a way to get back to our purpose of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. There, there's a feeling among a lot of folks on all sides of, that, uh, of the issue that these arguments, which the press loves, by the way, these arguments are in reality distracting us from what our primary mission is, that we need to get back to who we are. We need to reboot so how do we do that? How do we get back to the beginning, to the, to the last save point where everything worked? Well, that discussion will all come to a head next February in, in St. Louis. And I'm not a prophet. I'm not going to try to predict what will happen or what the future is going to be. I, I'm not good at that. I, I don't tend to predict the future. But here's what I do know. Built into who we are as Methodist Christians, there is a DNA that we need to somehow reclaim. You, you, you see, Methodism was never meant to be a church sitting on the corner waiting for people to come to us. Originally, Methodism wasn't meant to be a church at all. John Wesley, the, the, the founder of the Methodist movement, was and, and remained a clergyman in the Church of England until the day he died. And he was adamantly, during his lifetime, he was adamantly opposed to Methodism being anything other than a renewal movement for the larger church. It was only after his death when it became obvious that the differences between the Methodists and the Anglicans of the Church of England were too great. That's when separation took place in England, although it had taken place earlier in the United States because there was this little thing that came along, you might have heard of it, called the, the Revolutionary War. But even as an independent church, Methodism still retained particular characteristics, unique qualities that God had entrusted to our movement. God called us to be a particular people. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to look, take a look at the Methodist DNA, and I want to ask this question. What might happen if we took this seriously? If we took who God called us to be originally and went back to that safe point? Could a reboot of who we are make a difference in our community and, and, and in this world? What might happen if we, the people called Methodists, took our calling seriously again? Could we change the world for Jesus Christ just the way it happened in the days of Wesley and Whitfield and, and all of the rest of the early Methodists? Two years before Wesley's death, there was a document that was finalized called the Large Minutes. It, it has a series of questions and answers that were put to John Wesley. That, and there are several main topics, one of which is about how to carry out what's come to be known as annual conference. And some other things that he covers are how Methodist preachers were supposed to live and, and how small groups should be put together. That really was the genius of the early Methodists, the small groups. But in the midst of that, the third question in the, in the large minutes is this. What may we reasonably believe to be God's design in raising up the preachers and people called Methodist? And Wesley's answer is quick and to the point. He says this, not to form any new sect, but to reform the nation, particularly the church, and to spread scriptural holiness over the land. Holiness was the, the centerpiece of early Methodist theology, something that had been lost in the church up to that time. L largely in Wesley's day, if you were British, you were a member of the Church of England unless you had gone off and joined one of the, the dissenting churches. Among the Church of England, though, in those days, at that time, church attendance was low. And, and folks believed that, you know, if their name was on the membership role in the church, if they were members, they were set. They didn't have to change anything else or do anything else to have a relationship with God. They could live however they wanted as long as their name was on the membership role. And then along came these Methodists who spoke about God's call to holiness, who believed that there's a particular life God calls his people to live. And Wesley began to preach about that. It's probably no wonder that he writes in his journal time after time, I preach at such and such a church in the morning, I was asked never to return there again. Because you see, the call to holiness is a serious call. And it's a call today to reclaim our heritage, our birthright. The, the call to be holy is a call to be like the God in whose image we are created in the first place. Leonard Sweet observes that humans are the only species who pass up being what we were made to be. 
The very beginning of the Bible tells us who we're made to be. We're made in the image of God. And it also tells us very quickly that the his, in the history of the world, that image became marred. It became broken. It, it, it wasn't taken away entirely. It was broken. It was hidden. We're still made in the image of God, but we're given the choice as to whether or not we'll bear that image or whether we'll hide it. The, the story of the Bible, if you were going to sum it all up in a, in a short sentence, the story of the Bible really is, is a story of God reaching out to his people and calling us back to himself and of us pushing God away and, and running away and, and otherwise refusing to grow into the image of God. And so God sends his son, Jesus, to, to show us what a life like that could be like. And the human race did its worst to him. But, but there were those who believed the promise, those who, who wanted to be like Jesus, who wanted to follow him. And yet, even within that first generation of Christians, of, of followers of Jesus, there were struggles and there were challenges. Just like today, the culture was always there. It was pulling at them. It was tempting them. It was trying to shape those folks into its image rather than God's. And so Peter, one of the first followers of Jesus, puts his pen to paper to write to some followers of Christ all throughout Asia to encourage them to turn away from the world and toward Jesus. And so as he writes, Peter's undoubtedly remembering what he's been taught from his earliest days, that, that the heart of, his, of the Hebrew faith is found in a book that a lot of people don't read anymore. It's called the book of Leviticus. And there we find these words, be holy, God tells the people, because I'm holy. And Peter grabs onto that and he, and he takes that and he hands it on to the church, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Now, I'm not the sharpest crayon in the box, but I'm picking up that there's a key thing here called holiness. What does that mean? What does it mean to be holy? Now, for some folks, maybe for some of you this morning, that's kind of a, that word has a negative connotation. We've gotten this idea that, that being holy is, you know, just, if you, just subscribing to a list of do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts. We have this idea because there are folks, maybe folks in our own lives who have promoted that. Even in Jesus' day, there were people who saw it that way. They were, they were called the Pharisees, and they saw it as their personal mission to make sure that everybody was towing the line and following the rules, and not just the rules or commands or guidelines in the Bible. They wanted to make sure people followed the rules about the rules that they had written. All throughout history, there have been people just like that. You've probably, like I said, you've probably known one or two in your own life. Sometimes... We, when we think of the word holy, we think of those who are super spiritual, those who have a, a biblical answer or a Bible verse for every situation. The word that's translated holy in, in Peter's letter is not anything like that, but it has a root meaning of being uh, of different. It means to be set apart in every way and at every level. So, you know, we might think of something like Grandma's China. It, we set something apart and we only use it on special occasions. In terms of faith, William Barclay puts it this way. He says, the temple is holy because it's different from other buildings. The Sabbath is holy because it's different from other days. And the Christian is holy because he or she is different from the other people. Holiness at, at its root is not about just a list of rules and boundaries. It's about living a different way, living for a purpose. You know, tomorrow is, is Memorial Day, and I, I've been thinking about that this week, about those that we remember on this weekend, those who've given their lives in service to their country. These brave men and women were folks who were set apart, who were different from others, because when others ran for, away from danger, they run toward it. They were willing to give everything they were for the sake of a cause that they believed in. They lived life on purpose. They lived with, a, for a reason. As Christians, we're called to do the same thing. We're called to be holy, holy, giving everything that we are and everything that we will be over for the sake of God's kingdom. God says, be holy, because I am holy. Be different. Bear the image of God. Be like Jesus. Holy people just might change the world. There's a need for holiness in the 21st century, I think more than ever. We need people who are different, who are set apart, who, who want to change the world for Jesus' sake. I mean, there's so much division. There's so much hurt and, and, and anger in our world. There's so much death and, and destruction. We, even in our state, just an hour and a half away, had a shooting again this week in Noblesville. We are in such desperate need of people 
who want to live holy lives, who want to rise above the pettiness of our culture, who long to see the world transformed, changed, made new. Our calling, still today, our calling is to spread scriptural holiness across the land. That's in our DNA. And I believe Peter's directions all these centuries later can, can still give us clues about how to live in the 21st century as holy people. First thing he says is, he, is to have minds that are alert. Actually, the King James Version is closer to a literal translation. It says to gird up the loins of your mind. That's quite a, a, a combination of ancient images, isn't it? Gird up the loins of your mind. But he's referring to, in, in ancient times, men wore, men who didn't have to work for a living, men who were wealthy and prosperous, and they would wear these long flowing robes with belts around the waist. You didn't have to move quickly, and so the robes were fine. If they needed to run, though, or be ready to work hard, they would tuck the robe up into their belt so that their movement was unhindered. They would gird themselves up. They would be ready for action. Maybe the best equivalent today would be to, to roll up your sleeves or to take off your jacket. Peter's using this image of, to, of girding up to call us to readiness. He describes it later in this way. He says, always be prepared, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Peter's calling believers to, to be convinced of their faith, to, to know what you believe so that nothing and nobody can take it away from you, to be ready, to be ready. For us to, for today, as it did for them, it means that we need to be people who are reading the Scripture, who are getting it deep down inside of us, who are learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to engage our minds and our, our, our thinking. Josh McDowell famously said many years ago that we don't check our brains at the door when we become a Christian. We, we use our, engage our minds, our brains, and we, we, we learn what it is that the Bible says and what, what Christians believe. Without that, we, we, we don't have much hope of living a life that pleases God, that honors God. Holiness requires a mind that's alert, a mind that's engaged, that's, that's ready. Now, it's not just learning knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's not just learning Bible stories so we can, we can repeat them or so we can boast that, you know, I know more, sto more stories than you do. And that leads us to a second thing Peter says. He calls us to have minds that are fully sober. Now, we hear that word sober, and we, in our culture, in our language, we think it's an anti-alcohol statement, but that's not what Peter has in mind. It, it can mean that, not to be intoxicated, but it also, that word he uses also has a meaning of being steady in the mind. In this context, Peter seems to be saying that it's not just about knowing things, knowing about things, it's about taking what we know and applying it to the world around us. It has to do with ethics. It has to do with our working world. It has to do with our parenting. It has to do with friendships and romantic relationships and any other kind of relationships you can think of. To use Peter's words, having a mind that's fully sober means we have a balanced judgment. We are living out this faith that we say we believe. You know, it's awfully easy for us to read the Bible and then put it back on the shelf and, and within minutes we've forgotten what we read. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands if anybody's ever done that, but it's easy to do because we, it, it doesn't get inside of us. It doesn't begin to affect the way that we live, the way it should. I, I've told this story before, so you may have heard it, but I, I've often said the worst parking lot to get out of is the one after a Christian event. I was at a Promise Keepers event in Indianapolis several years ago. Back when they did the big two-day event, you went on Friday night, and then you were there most of the day on Saturday, too. And so I was at this event, thousands of Christian men, and we were singing God's praises, and we were learning what it means to be faithful followers and faithful husbands. And, and, and so we sang, and we, and we worshiped, and we listened. And then we all, you know, in the spirit of Christ, we went out to the parking lot, to our cars, to, our, to go to our hotels for the night. And in that parking garage, I saw people cutting each other off. I saw yelling at each other and, and not a whole lot of grace anywhere in that parking garage. More road rage than any kind of holiness. And I wondered later, after I got out of the garage, I wondered, would anybody have known that we were part of a Christian conference? Does, does what we believe impact the way that we live, even in things as simple as a parking garage? Have a fully sober mind. Don't just know it. Be engaged with it. Live it, Peter says. This is a key to holiness. And that leads us to the next thing Peter says in verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. 
Now, we might hear echoes of Paul here. Paul wrote to the Romans in a verse that Pastor Rick loves to quote. He says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform. Now, in that context, Peter says he's got in mind the image of a parent-child relationship where the, where the child wants to model their life after that of a, of a parent. Now, Christopher's here this morning. He's moved back in with us this week for a while, and so I get to embarrass him this morning if that's even possible. One of my fondest memories, though, is the day when uh, he was probably, it wasn't maybe, maybe four years old. Rachel wasn't born yet, and Kathy was at work, and we were in the parsonage at, at Brushwood Church, just he and I, and it was after preschool. I was, I remember because he was sitting on the counter, and I was, I was making lunch, and we were talking about that age-old question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would guess they probably talked about it at, at preschool that day. And so I was saying, well, maybe you want to be a, you know, a policeman or a fireman, all the things that little boys, you know, want to, want to do when they're, when they're that age. And as clear as day, I'll never forget, clear, clear as day, Christopher said to me, no, daddy, I want to be just like you. Yeah, he could have asked for anything at that moment, and I would have given it to him. <laughs> Doesn't work today, however, so. I, he, he, you know, he completely melted my heart in that moment. And, and I think about that. If that happens to us as earthly fathers, can you imagine what happens to the heart of our heavenly father when we decide we want to be obedient children and be more like him? Can you imagine what happens in heaven when we say, Father, I want to be just like you? I want to be holy because my Father is holy. But to be able to do that, Peter says, we have to make some changes. There are, there are things we have to say no to so that we can say yes to better things. We, we have to make a choice, Peter says, not to conform to the world or, as Peter puts it, to the evil desires we once had. Now, for Peter's original audience, those desires could have been a wide variety of things, from dishonest behavior in the marketplace to, to worshiping false gods in the pagan temples and, and all sorts of stuff in the middle. Over in his letter to the Galatians, Paul describes what the Galatians' life before Christ had been like, and I, I want to use Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, the message here, because he doesn't pull any punches. This is what, how Paul describes their life before Christ. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, and then he says, I could go on. <laughs> Paul says, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We say no to those things so that we can say yes to the better life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it's not about breaking the rules. It's about making a choice as to what we want to be like. Do we want to be like God who gave, who, who gave his son's life for us? Or do we want to be like the world that will turn its back on us in a heartbeat? Do we want to live the life the way our heavenly father designed it to be lived? Or do we want to live our own way and just make it up as we go? Because God will allow us to live out our choices. C.S. Lewis said that the time will come we'll either, that either we will say to God, thy will be done, or he will say to us, thy will be done. Holiness is about turning everything we have and everything we are over to him. Be holy, he says, because I am holy. Be holy, holy. Now, becoming holy is not a three-step process. It's not, you know, read this book and you'll have it all figured out. It's waking up every day and saying to Jesus, today I'm going to be your person again. It's a thousand little decisions each and every day that we choose to turn away from what the world offers and receive what God offers. It's a whole lot broader and deeper than just say no to whatever is on today's list of bad things. It's a life given completely over to God, a life focused on pleasing God and, and, a, and a life of gratitude for all that Christ has done for us. I mean, let's be honest. We don't always feel like living that life. We don't always wake up in the morning and feel like we want to live 
holy lives. Sometimes it would just be easier to do our own thing or, or to follow the world around us. But gratitude calls us a different way. Gratitude calls us to a way of blessing that we would not and do not get any other way. Several years ago, I was fairly new in ministry, and, and uh, the pastor that I had growing up, who'd been at our church for 11 years when I was growing up, he hunted me down at annual conference, and he was retiring that year. He said he had something he wanted to give me. And I smiled and said, okay, that sounds good. And inside I'm thinking, oh, great, he's retiring and wants to unload some junk on me. And so I sort of avoided him for the rest of annual conference. At the end of the ordination service on Saturday, he found me and said, hey, where are you parked? Well, I was stuck. I couldn't get out of it. So we met up in the parking lot, and, and I, I have to tell you, my heart was not in it. I met him, though, out of gratitude because of, for all that he had done for me, not because I felt like it. And then he surprised me with a, with a huge whole set of biblical commentaries and said, here, I hope these will be useful to you in your ministry. I want you to have them. And they have been. I use them nearly every week. And I thought of that this week, and, and the blessing that I would have missed if I had responded like my feelings wanted to, instead of out of gratitude. It's the same way with God. We live out of gratitude, not out of the way we feel from moment to moment. We don't always feel like living holy lives. But at those times, we remember all that God has done for us. When we respond and, and, and seek to live like Jesus out of a sense of gratitude, even when we don't feel like it, we will find blessing that we didn't expect. And maybe, just maybe, the world can be changed when God's people begin to live holy, holy lives. There's one more thing Peter mentions that's important for us as Methodist Christians because it's a, it's a vital part of our holiness DNA. Peter says it this way he's in verse 13. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As we become more and more like Jesus, we become more and more people of hope. Friends, when, when you look around at the world and you, know, you listen to the news, we had the news on this morning and people are just yelling at each other and arguing with each other. When you skim through social media, which you see a lot of the same thing, when we listen to the political commentary or even to listen to our friends at the, at the coffee shop, the temptation is to despair sometimes, to give up, to wonder why we even bother living holy lives. But Christians are not people of despair. Christians are people of hope. Peter says we should set our hope on what Jesus is coming to bring us, eternal life, abundant life, a grace-filled life. We're called to hope. Not to despair. No matter how bad things get here, we know that there's more to this life and that there's life beyond this. I say it often, and I'm going to keep saying it until we believe it. The worst thing is never the last thing. And so if it's bad, it's not the end. There's always hope. And that's why even in the midst of, of denominational disagreements, I refuse to despair and I'm determined not to give up. I live in hope because my faith rests not in the United Methodist Church or in anything in this world. My faith and my hope rests in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And so I make the choice every morning, Jesus, I want to be your person. I want to live a holy life. And sometimes I get it right and sometimes I get it wrong. But every morning I'm given a new chance, a brand new day to start over. I want to challenge you to do the same, to answer this call to holiness each and every morning and to be people of hope. The worst thing is never the last thing. There's always hope. Be holy, because he who has called us is holy. Be holy, holy. Let's pray. And if you'd like to come and kneel at the steps this morning as we pray, you're invited to do that at this time. We invite you to do that now as we go to God in prayer this morning. Gracious and loving God, holy God, we give you thanks this morning for your call to live a life on purpose, to live a life that's different than the despair that we see around us. And so God, this morning and every morning from here on out, help us to wake up to be ready to live lives as your people, to live holy lives, to live lives of hope. We give you thanks this morning 
for this community that comes alongside of us in days of difficulty and, and struggle and is there in days of sunshine and grace. We thank you for this community that helps us to live the way you're calling us and you've called us to live. And especially, Lord, we thank you for those times when life gets hard and we, we need someone there that, there's, that you've provided this church family, this congregation, and that we can share with one another and know that our burdens are lifted up. And so we pray this morning for those who are in need today, for those who are hurting. We pray for Sarah Pierce. We pray for Ivan, Sherilyn Canock's brother. We pray for Grandma Edwards. We pray for Cassie Strucker. And for others that we have not or aren't able to mention, Lord, hear our prayers this morning from our hearts to your throne in this moment of quiet. Even, God, as we thank you for this congregation, we pray for our larger church, for our bishop, Julius Trimble, for our superintendent, John Groves, for the leadership of this church and for the churches that make up your church throughout the Wabash Valley. We give you thanks for the opportunities we have to reach this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray we would be faithful to that calling, that you would use us as a part of a larger mission, a part of a larger purpose to make a difference in this community. And we pray for our larger church, for the United Methodist Church. God, as you continue to mold and shape us into who you have, you'll have us to be for the future, we pray for grace and for mercy and for a way forward. Lord, we pray for those in Noblesville this morning, for the, the school there and for those who've been in the midst of that shooting, for those who've been traumatized. We thank you for Noblesville First Church and the ministry that they have done and are continuing to doing, being right across the street from the school. God, we give you thanks for, for their pastor and their leadership as they seek to make a difference and offer a cup of cold water in Christ's name to that community. God, may we all be aware and in ministry in ways that we can offer your grace and your mercy to our community. We give you thanks this morning in the precious and holy name of Jesus in whose name we offer this prayer and all of our prayers. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, I didn't work. I want to take a moment just to wish you a happy Memorial Day and as you're gathered with, well, that's not going to work, is it? As you're gathered with friends and family this weekend, that it, it'll be a blessing to you. Also, don't forget to pick up a newsletter on the way out uh, as, you, as you go to catch up on all the things happening in June. Let's stay in, shall we, as we prepare to go this morning. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and in you as you seek to live holy lives. Go in his peace. Amen.